Hello and welcome to Around the World in 88 Tales. I'm David Heathfield. I'm here in the museum at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, um, Around the World in 88 Tales. And I'm delighted to be with a storytelling friend, uh, Maria Papa Nicolaou. I'm That's sorry right. if your pronunciation isn't so good. It was nice. Um, it was, oh, great. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, Maria, tell us, where are you? I live in Nemea. Have you heard of the Lion of Nemea? Oh, the I first, haven't actually. The, the first deed of uh, Hercules? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I live uh, very close to the place where Hercules killed the lion and took uh, um, uh, his first deed uh, and uh, then proceed to the others. And uh, Nemea is in Corinth, Greece, at the Peloponnese. Peloponnese is uh, center south, in the center south of, uh, of Greece. Yes, please find it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to do it now. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to change my background so we'll be able to see properly. There we are. Okay. 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 So I've only got a whole globe so to get the detail it's, it's a tiny oh. it's a tiny um uh country greece but with great uh, history and past uh you can see the peloponnese there in what purple the yes corinth is in the north of the peloponnese and nemea is uh, some uh, 30 kilometers far from corinth this is right. where i live i used to live in athens uh, I came here with my family uh, eight uh, years ago, and I'm very happy to be here, uh, sharing stories um, all around the Peloponnese and Greece as a storyteller. I studied history. I studied also at the um, Metropolitan University of uh, Leeds, history, uh, social and cultural history, and I got my master's degrees from there um, in 2006 and then I came back to Greece I work uh, I worked uh, at publishing houses making books and um, two years earlier in 2004 I, I, I knew storytelling through my uh, teacher Estelios Pelasgos uh, and uh, since then I tell stories too it's like 17 years now. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. Yes. And, and why, why did you want to be part of this project, Maria? Why not? <laughs> uh, I, I know that you are always uh, inspire people and mostly people to tell stories. Uh, I have um, uh, great confidence in your project. And of course, I know that uh, we all love stories and uh, stories are to be shared. Uh, we have to share stories, to tell stories, so they are alive and uh, we continue to tell them and hear them. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that unites us all. Absolutely. From Japan to Argentina to Brazil, where Vera is, to the UK where you are. All over the world anyway absolutely absolutely yeah. i couldn't agree more <laughs> well yes, maria it's, very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting project i'm very happy to be here thank you for inviting me oh uh, i'm delighted i i am watch. delighted to be a part of it thank you thank you well our our object our museum object that we're going to be inspired by is from the far north from greenland this kayak and it's an amazing artifact. It's made from wood and seal skin. 
and the seal skin is stretched over a wooden frame and you can see the in the middle here where the the uh the hunter or the fisherman would have sat almost inside because it was sitting low in the water and below you can see the oar a double-ended paddle um so this this was made before um 1849 so it was collected and and then later donated to the museum and the paddle is made of wood and has bone tips to make it i suppose very strong for paddling in all sorts of conditions so this very traditional kayak boat made me think about a, a boat from a very different part of the world and the story that I would like to tell actually comes from the rainforest of Brazil. And it's a story that's told by the Camaiura. Let me say that again. Camaiura people who come from the Zingu River region. And this and many other stories were collected by two brothers called Villas Boas many years ago. And uh, these traditions were maintained through their collecting of traditional stories from the indigenous people. So here we go with the story that I would like to share. Please. There was once a man who decided to make a canoe. So he went to a jatoba tree and he peeled the bark from the outside of the tree and he worked and he worked until he had made a canoe so he could go fishing on the river. But just when his canoe was finished, he heard news that his wife had given birth to a baby. So he went home and he remained with his wife and the newborn child. And only days later, he said, now I must go fishing. But will my canoe still be intact? So he went back to the tree, to the Jatoba tree, to find his canoe, but his canoe was not there. He looked and waited. And then he heard. Shh, shh. And coming towards him, dragging its way through the trees, was his canoe. And the canoe came closer and closer, and either side of the prow there were eyes looking at him. My canoe has become a spirit. And he was afraid. But the canoe stopped in front of him and rocked from side to side, inviting him to climb in. So he sat into the canoe and the canoe started dragging its way through the trees. Towards the river. And when the canoe reached the river, it plunged into the water. And as soon as the canoe was in the water, fish started jumping and landing inside the canoe. But strangely, their canoe ate the fish. <coughs> well, the man in the canoe saw all of this. But when the canoe had finished eating fish, the next fish that came in the canoe remained. The canoe took the man to the river bank, climbed out of the river and pulled itself through the trees back to the Jatoba tree. The man got out of the canoe and took the many fish that were left. And he came to his wife and they had plenty to eat. Well, this was well. They had enough for many days. But then he said to his wife, I will go fishing again. I will have many fish. And he took a sack 
to carry all of the fish. He came back to the Jatoba tree, but his canoe was not there. Canoe! My canoe! Come to me! And through the trees came the canoe, dragging itself towards him. And the canoe rocked from side to side and he climbed in and the canoe dragged itself down to the river bank and plunged into the river. He was ready with his sack. The fish began jumping, but he caught each fish in his sack and his sack was getting fuller and fuller. I have so many fish for my wife and for my family and for my community. I have so many fish. But he had forgotten that the first fish were for the canoe itself. And the hungry canoe <coughs> swallowed the fisherman and carried on sailing down the river. His wife and little child never saw him again. Well, there is a warning story from the wow. <laughs> Amayura people of the wonderful Amayura story. Rainforest. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very and much. If you're David. watching this as a recording on Facebook or on YouTube, please do tell us what you think of the stories that you hear. Tell us who you are and where you are as well. Yes. So, Maria Papa Nicolaou. Yes. <laughs> in Greece. In Greece. Is there a story that you would like to tell us? You know, David, living in Greece, there are plenty of stories, of course, as you know, we have great mythology, but um, sometimes stories are so many that you, you can't choose one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I was inspired from this canoe because I've heard of a story of an old man in Corfu, Greece, you know, the island of Corfu, Greece, that he used a boat made out of papyrus straws. You know, the papyrus, the, um, the plant of which they made um, paper, like paper to write in Egypt. Something like 9,000 years before, Greece was full of papyrus, papyruses. So I, I uh, remembered the story and I was inspired uh, to make one of my own. So. Wow. <laughs> you made one of your own? Yes. <laughs> so I'll try to tell it for the first time here for you in Ram. And I hope everything goes well. I'm sure it will. I like Tell you. us your story. <laughs> okay. I have no name. At least I don't remember having one. I am one of the tribe. It doesn't matter. I think that nobody has a name. We live in a cage. We live in a cave. A very large cave. It is very big, and we all feel secure. Some archaeologists, centuries later, will tell you that we are living in the Neolithic period, in a cave in Peloponnese, Greece. Life is simple. Life is simple, but it is very dangerous for us. We have to do two things. We have to find something to eat, to keep us alive. 
And we have to stay inside the cave to stay alive too, out of dangers, animals, weather conditions, or other tribes. Inside the cave, we are all safe. We are foragers, hunters, and fishermen. I shouldn't have lived. I was born with one feet shorter than the other. They were ready to throw me away to die. But that day, the day that I was born, they got, they got a big buffalo and they were very, very happy about it. That could fed our tribe for many, many days. So that was a good omen. They let me leave. I could walk, but I could not walk as the others. I could run, but I couldn't run like the others. But I was there and I wanted to help. I lived inside that great cave. In the night, we got all together. I don't know who gave birth to me. I don't know who is my mother, who is my father. I only know that I am. Every day is a different day. We have to select fruit, vegetables, roots to eat. I cannot hunt because I have one leg shorter than the other. I shouldn't have lived. I can walk, but I am not walking like the others. I can run, but I'm not running like the others, but I am good with my hands. I can make things. You know, the sea is not far away from our cave. At the seaside, there are many, many papyrus straws. The plants that I always like to go there and hide because I don't want to be seen from the others. I don't feel good about my leg, but I feel good near the sea. I can hear the sound of the, way, the, the, sound of the waves. I can see the sky blue all around me. I can hear the wind blowing inside papyruses. And I can fish. I am very good at making fishing hooks out of small bones, fish bones, or goat bones. I can make them so good that I can catch fishes. And I have a dream. In the night, I am dreaming that I am sailing on the sea. They make fun of me. They always make fun of me. But I'm good with my hands. I can't walk like the others. I can't, I can't run like the others, but I can make things with my, with my hands. And I am not clever. This is what, what the archeologists are going to say centuries and, and centuries later. But I can make something. One day, I caught all the papyrus trosses and my, I made paddles using rope out of the canes. And I tied them all together and I tried to make something that could sail on the sea. I never did it at once. I tried and I tried and I tried until one day, I made something that could sail on the waves 
on the blue sea, on the sea, that now they are calling it Aegean Sea inside the Mediterranean. I was never there to see if somebody else used the thing I made because I died soon after. But then I know that centuries and centuries later, they found out that in the island of Corfu, a man like me made a similar something out of papyrus. And they said that this thing I made with my hands, papyruses and robes was the first boat ever made in the world 9,000 year, 9, years before. And they called it Papirella. The Papirella still exists in Corfu, Greece. And I'm very glad that I made the first boat in the world. Oh, wow, thank you very much, Maria. You're taking us in our imaginations back to the very, very first creation of a floating vessel, the first boat from Neolithic times, near where you live. Yes, uh, I, I want to say that uh, if you visit, why not, if you visit Pel the Peloponnese, you could find this cave in Argolis, Argolida, uh, near um, uh, the sea. And uh, the name of the cave that still exists, and um, it's, um, they say that uh, it's been there for for, for 40,000 years, <laughs> uh, the name of the cave is Frachthi. And it is still there. You can go and visit it. And maybe you can find a footprint of my hero that lived there around 9,000 years before. Wow. Thank you very, very much. No, thank that you. That inspired me. I don't know I if think, I managed to... I think to... your story is set... I'm, I, I, maybe I'm right in saying your story is set further back than I think any of the other stories told <laughs> so far during this project. And that's, a, that's just wonderful. And it fits so well with the project Ooh. and the museum and the artefacts. Just imagining how these amazing things, like the, these simple but so new uh, sailing vessels, whether it's a seal skin covered kayak in Greenland, whether it's a bark canoe from the Amazon rainforest, or even further back perhaps, a uh, papyrus sailing craft in Greece. Wow. Yes. Um, it's, I, I thank you very much for inspiring me. Uh, well, thank remembering you for inspiring the story. us, Maria. <laughs> And of course, um, stories are m much more older than we imagine them to be. Isn't that right? We, 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 I'm sure that's right. We don't know how these stories, you know, way, way, way before they were recorded and written down, how long these stories have been being told. And I'm just going to read out one comment that's coming in the Facebook from um, Philip Clark here in Exeter, who says it's an, what you did was an intriguing way of telling a story. I was right there with you on the beach, beautifully told. So you Thank transported you. us with the, in our imaginations. Thank, Thank you very much, Maria. Thank, Thank you, you for being much. part of Around the World in 88 Tales. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't buy the trees. I can't buy the deepest seas But it don't matter Cause they're there for free